Hello, I'm doing a movie review and I'm joined by my friend Bill Burns, who is a college professor. Hello, everybody. And we're reviewing the notorious war film Men Behind the Sun, also known as Black Sun 731. Released in Hong Kong in 1988, the film was directed by T.F. Mo, who prior to this made some politically charged films in Taiwan, which ended up getting banned by the Taiwanese government. After relocating to Hong Kong, Mo made several films for Shaw Brothers, such as Gun, Bankbusters, A Deadly Secret, and Lost Souls. Men Behind the Sun was highly controversial upon its release, and to this day it's still considered to be one of the most notorious exploitation films ever made, even though it's actually hotly debated whether the film is just a straight exploitation film or if it's actually trying to make a point. But the film is also considered to be one of the most disturbing films ever made, being ranked alongside films like Cannibal Holocaust, and Sallow. The film is a dramatization of the real-life events of Unit 731 and the atrocities committed there, and based on several documentaries I've watched on Unit 731, the film is actually a lot closer to the actual events than I initially thought. Unit 731 was a research base run by the Japanese Imperial Army during World War II, more specifically during the Second Sino-Japanese War and then Japanese-occupied Manchuria. At this base, the Japanese were trying to develop biological weapons, but what the unit is most infamous for is the horrific experiments conducted primarily on Chinese and Russian prisoners, some of whom were POWs, but many were actual civilians who were basically taken off the streets. Bill, what do you think of this movie, and what are your thoughts on the actual events that the film is based on? Uh, well, I guess, I mean, this, to start off, I actually first saw the film, I want to say, like, in the early 1990s. Um, I think um, I was on a bootleg VHS tape that I rented from a local uh, video store called 112 Video that actually, you know, had a lot of these, you know, rare films. I had read about it in fanzines at the time, I think, like, Asian cult cinema. So I had read about this movie that was just, like, people would just... Like, you know, it was it blew people's minds. So, of course, I, I wanted to see it. Um, the tape that I viewed was kind of like a low um, resolution, like low quality. All but right. in some ways, it sort of like made it even more real to see it like that. Like, it was almost like you're watching something from the past. So that even made it more like brutal and more traumatic. So uh, I remember seeing it and just being very uh, stunned by it. There was a lot of rumors about it that, you know, they use real corpses in the movie that people really were killed was this a snuff did they actually do these things to the people although now when you look back on it some of the special effects are kind of clunky so well i mean tf mo did actually use real corpses for the film from what i understand well i'm talking about like the part where the the woman's skin is taken from her like skeletal yeah that like was... that but um but no i mean I, at the time i was just like i was stunned by it you know and uh, I had no, and this is pre or very early internet, so I didn't know anything about, um, you know, this unit. I didn't know anything about, um, you know, I I had never seen any documentaries about it. I had not certainly not heard about it like in school, where where we've, you know, we learned of course about the Holocaust and about of course the, the horrible experimentation that went on in, in the death camps. But I had never heard about this ever until seeing this movie. Yeah, and that's funny because I feel like the war crimes that Japan committed during World War II really do not get talked about as much as the Holocaust. And that's not to say that Japan hasn't suffered during World War II. They certainly have. But I'm really not sure if Japan has really answered for a lot of the things they've done during World War II. I mean, again, they certainly have suffered during the Second World War, especially with the atomic bombings. But I'm still not sure if they have really, if the Japanese government has really made amends for the things they've done. Well, I think one of the, the reasons why that might be is just um, geography. Um, I think because the United States um, had such a presence in the European theater during World War II and, of course, occupied Germany and, and you know, afterwards, the, the, those, the death camps were much more visible. And I think there was much more interaction with... Um, the people that suffered in the death camps in, in the European theater for the United States. You got to remember that the these Japanese camps were in China after World War II. Immediate, almost immediately, you had the the Chinese Civil War between you know Mao Tse Tung and you had um, uh, Shanghai Shek. Uh, the United States did not occupy China, so I think you know what I mean. So I think just in in terms of geography and and just of where the United States and the occupying forces were 
maybe that's one of the reasons why there wasn't as much information about this as there was, you know, where in Germany and in Poland, it was right in, in, in the U.S.'s faces. But one thing about Unit 731 is the Japanese tried to bury it when they realized that they were losing the war. Like, they tried to bury what they did, and most fucked up thing about it all is that a lot of the war criminals who ran this unit got off scot-free, basically. Well, I mean, the Germans tried to do the same thing, right? The Nazis tried to do the same thing, but, of course, it, it, both, you know, Germany and Japan at the time being, fa you know, fascist, uh, you know, governments, um, you know, didn't say anything wrong with what they were doing until the very last minute, so they had all this documentation that they could not get rid of in time, you know, so that's why I think the, these things are so well documented, at least on paper, um, but yeah, I mean, right, Operation Paperclip, where um, I think that the United States... And um, Soviet Union probably realized that the you know that that information was going to be the next real um, you know important weapon in in the coming years. So therefore, they just like scooped up the scientists, you know, doctors, scientists, professors, all these people who were all you know guilty of these crimes, who who, who perpetrated horrible, horrible uh, atrocities on people in the name of ideology, in the name of science, in the name of medicine. And that's one of the things that I really like about the film. And I, and I, I think the title of the film is so evocative: "Men Behind the Sun," because. Uh, of course, the sun re re refers to the Japanese flag, right? The Japanese flag has the sun there, you know? But this movie is not about Japan. It's not about... It's, not a, it's about the men behind the flag. That we want to blame these things on nationalism, but nationalism doesn't exist outside of human beings. Mm -hmm. So you could blame and say, well, it's, it's because of nationalism that this happened, or it's because of Nazism or fascism. That's all well and good, but human beings did these things. Human beings were behind all these things. So that's why I love the title of the movie. This movie is about the men behind the atrocities. The men who sort of tried to use the flag, you know what I mean, nationalism, to cover those things up. To hide behind. To justify what they were doing. You know? So that's why I think the, 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 the title is so uh, important to this film. Now, what the film primarily focuses on a group of young boys from Japan who are drafted into the Japanese army and are assigned to Unit 731. And throughout the film, they're basically conditioned and indoctrinated into believing that what they're doing at this base is for the good of the Japanese Empire. And they witness these atrocities being committed and are even told to refer to the prisoners as Maruta, which literally translates to logs, something to be burned, which is something that the prisoners at the base were actually referred to in real life. Uh, all right, so what is that? That is a man, sir. Boom! <laughs> You tell me what that is. He is a Chinese man. <laughs> you tell me what that is. Sir, he is a very bad Chinese man. <laughs> Take it out. Now remember, that is called a Maruta. It's a log for the fire or for making coffins. It's material for experiments. It is called a Maruta. Now, tell me what it is. Maruta, sir. I can't hear what you're saying. Maruta! Here, tell me what it is. Maruta! 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 All right, what is this? Maruta! In the film, we follow a young man named Ishikawa, who at first is deeply devoted to their mission there, and does see these prisoners as being less than human. It's all just a question of humanitarianism. Don't you understand? No, this concerns the rise and fall of our great empire. Listen, Ishikawa, they're human beings just like us. They have parents too, don't you understand what I'm saying? That's all nonsense! They're prisoners, how can you say that? Oh, gentlemen, come on, this is Sunday. Let's not discuss business here. Come on, let's eat. Okay, everybody, this fruit was brought over specially from Japan. Please help yourselves. Oh, madam, you mustn't carry heavy things. Let me help you. Oh, thank you. Maybe you can tell me the difference between the child that Mrs. Tanamura is going to have and a Maruta's child. What's that? No. You should not have said that. How can you compare we Japanese people to a Maruta? We don't speak the same language. I have nothing more to say to you. 
It is only when a mute Chinese boy that he is befriended is murdered by these people that Ishikawa becomes disillusioned with the mission and realizes that what they're doing there is wrong. Bring him in now. Sir. Hey, hey, come on, come here. Come, come, come. Now, you go in there, understand? Ishikawa, you wait here. You can take him back again. Only when his surgery is finished. What surgery? Be quiet. No more questions. It's not your business. Keep out of it. Sir. Now, one thing I think is really interesting about the film, and this is where you could probably make the argument that this really isn't an exploitation film, is the fact that the Japanese characters in the movie, even though they are technically the villains of the film, I actually think the Japanese are portrayed very three-dimensionally in the film, because, like I said, the film primarily follows these young Japanese boys who are kind of just brainwashed into thinking that what they're doing is right, and there's also one Japanese doctor who actually is deeply disgusted by what they're doing there, so it shows that not all of the men working at Unit 731 enjoyed what they were doing. Are you okay? <laughs> Sir! What's wrong with you? He's been here for over a month, but he still hasn't managed to adjust, sir. He vomits every time he comes and works on these experiments. And when he gets like this, we have no alternative but to let him take a break. I think, sir, it'll take him a while to get used to this. Don't worry about it. I'm sure he'll soon get used to it. His job is very important. We rely on the colors to determine the results of these experiments. As you know, we can't just depend on black and white pictures. So take care of him and get him back to work. Sir. So I would argue that the film does portray the Japanese very three-dimensionally, but what do you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that what happens in the movie, what, what, is, um, what is shown and expressed in the movie, um, is not just symptomatic of fascism. I think you could probably make this movie about, um, you know, the experiments that went on with um, you know, African-American men in the United States. You could probably, you know, do this in any number of cultures, any number of ideologies. And he's still going to get basically the same kind of uh, understanding that indoctrination dehumanizes people. One of the things that I really enjoy about the movie is that it shows that this kind of indoctrination does not just dehumanize the victim, it also dehumanizes the perpetrator. And I think that's what we see in the movie, right? And I love the opening, remember the opening quote? Isn't there an opening quote, something about history and... Friendship is friendship, history is history. And I think it's brilliant. What a great way of saying it is that there's no compassion in history. History is, is written by the victors. History is written by those in power. Power dehumanizes. That's what it does. And I think in this movie, that's what we see. But, but again, the key thing is, is that power does not just dehumanize its victims. It also dehumanizes its perpetrators. And I think you really see that in the film. That's why it's important to get that three-dimensional kind of approach to the characters in this film to see how dehumanized they become. And again, it depends, I guess, on the strength of your indoctrination and, and also it depends on um, what you've been indoctrinated into. Because I, I think another thing that's really interesting is that the soldiers start to become disillusioned, but the scientists and the doctors don't really become disillusioned because their indoctrination is not into fascism. Their indoctrination is into science, into medicine, right? Which is the ultimate supposedly objective kind of, you know, perspective. And so that's why you get these people who, instead of looking at these uh, subjects as uh, human beings, they're seen as logs. They're seen as, you know, um, something to be worked on, objects, you know, and so to me, I mean, I think that's like the, the scientists and the professors who are supposed to be the most smartest, the doctors that are supposed to be the most compassionate, right? Don't doctors take an oath that says, that says do no harm. They are the most inhuman people in this film. And they don't care, right? Because no matter what they can do to other human beings, they can always say it's in the name of science. It's in the name of medicine, right? And again, just like with the idea of you know, fascism and nationalism, what is science? What is medicine? They're not things that exist, you know, by themselves. Science and medicine are created by human beings. Human beings are the ones that actually, are, you know, make up medicine and science. So to blame this dehumanization on science is ridiculous or on medicine or on nationalism, whatever. 
It's just a cover. It's a justification for doing what you want to do with another human being, exerting power over them. Because if you think about it, doctors, scientists, professors have an enormous amount of power over other people. They're authority figures, you know? And I think this film shows what happens when you have no balances on, the, on that power. When you just let science run wild. When you let national run wild. When you let these things run wild and there's no accountability for this, right? There's no accountability here. They could do whatever they want to these people. You know, there's no watchdogs coming in and telling them you can't do this. There's no, there's no checks and balances on their power. And that's what you get. When you have no checks and balances on power, you get this sort of insanity, this idea that everything you're doing is objective, everything that there's no bias in it, which is ridiculous. Of course, there was a tremendous racial bias, an ethnic bias, right? The Japanese thought they were superior to the Chinese, Right? And because of that, right, same thing with what we saw in, in Germany in World War II. Same, same mentality. This idea that if I'm superior to you, I can do whatever I want to you. I have a God-given right, right, or biological right, or whatever right you want to sort of fall back on to do whatever I want to you, and there is going to be no consequences. And something that you just reminded me of is there's a scene towards the end of the movie when they're trying to destroy the unit where you had that one doctor who had the pregnant wife, I forgot the character's name, but he's telling them to stop burning the data. And at one point he tells General Ishii, he says, listen, if we destroy this data, like we've all sacrificed so much. And I almost get the idea that the reason he doesn't want to destroy the data is he doesn't want to admit that he killed all those people for nothing. This is important data, you can't burn it. Damn it! Stop right now or I'll shoot you! Oh, stop it! Don't shoot! We're going home now! Nothing else matters! Get out of here! <laughs> I just wanted to go home! I just want to go home! Stop it! You burn anymore and I'll shoot you down! I'm not making idle threats! Burn it all! Sir! Listen, this is an order. You must burn it all. Nothing must be left behind. <laughs> Sir, we can't destroy this. This is our whole reason for being here. It represents years of hard work. To amass this data, we've all had to sacrifice a great deal. And sir, Japan will need it one day. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and that connects over to this idea of recruiting the scientists afterwards, right? These scientists who did these things, these doctors, these scientists, never were brought to trial because, like you just mentioned, right, their data was seen as important. Somebody else gave it validity. Right, either the Soviets gave it validity, or, or the scientists they they grabbed up, or the United States gave it validity. So that's why they never had to face their crimes because the two superpowers said, "Your data is good. Your data was important. So why would you punish somebody if their data is important? If their work is good, you know." So I think that's important. The soldiers all got punished because the nationalism was destroyed. Right, the fascist state was destroyed. So you can't fall back on that. I mean, the, you know, the, the Germans tried to, right? The Germans tried to fall back and said, I was just following orders. But because their, their system fell, you can't use that justification. But because science and technology and medicine all emerged from this as the new gods of our society, they don't have to account for it. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's why in the film, that's why they don't, you know, they're not punished. They don't feel any guilt. Whereas the soldiers, the other people, do feel guilt. Because they realize they can see through the nationalism to, you know, wh what we're really doing to these people. But again, for the scientists, for the professors, for the doctors, all they see is just a bunch of biological data, right? And that, they're gonna, and that data is more important than the lives of these individuals. Now, what do you think of, like, some of the characters in the film, like uh, Ishikawa or uh, the one doctor who actually does feel remorse over what they're doing? Like, how do you feel the characters are in the film? I think it's, that, that's, it's important to have those characters because then it's not just propaganda or it's not just straight exploitation, which, which I want to talk a little bit more later about that. But I think those characters are important because I, can, I imagine I imagine there probably was uh, people at, at, in, at the death camps that, or Nazis probably said, to themselves, this is wrong. No matter how much ideology I swallow, no matter how many propaganda films I see, no matter how much these people are telling me that it's right to do this, it's wrong. So I think that's that's important to have those those characters that are foils to these official people who are saying that this is all uh, you know for our God and country or for or, or for science and for the, the betterment of the future. You know all these kind of you know um, excuses that they come up with. It's important to have those characters that um, can see through that. Get 
give me that. Now, what do you think of the characterization of General Shiro Ishii, who's kind of portrayed as the villain of the film, and he is one of the few characters in the film who I will say is probably not really portrayed three-dimensionally. At the same time, this guy was an actual human monster, so maybe it's not entirely unfair that the movie portrays him as a monster, but what do you think of the characterization of him in this movie? I imagine it's probably very realistic. How could you do those things and not be and not shut off that compassion, not shut off the the, the uh, your humanity? So I actually probably think it's it's probably very re- the fact that he wasn't three dimensional. It's probably more realistic than if they did make him three dimensional. Supposedly, uh, and I read this on Wikipedia, so take this with a grain of salt. But supposedly, in the final years of his life, he converted to Catholicism. And I'm just thinking, if there is a God. I hope he prayed hard because it's probably very hard to get into heaven after doing what you did. Well, it's maybe guilt. Maybe it was the guilt he felt, and he felt he had, was looking for something to um, alleviate that guilt. I, that's it's interesting. I didn't know that about him, but um, yeah, maybe he was just looking for something to to take that sort of um, you know that that negativity and and sort of that the guilt that he must have felt um, you know off of him. I don't know if it worked, though. There's a scene in the movie where General Ishii throws a cat into all these rats, and the rats eat the cat. Now, supposedly, that was a real cat, and it was actually being eaten by rats. However, TF Mo has claimed that the cat is actually covered in dyed honey, and the rats are just licking the honey off the cat's body. Maybe that's true, but that could also be him trying to cover his ass. And later on in the film, when they're trying to destroy the unit, you see all the rats on fire. And there's no way he faked that. Those were actual rats on fire. Uh, So there is definitely, even if the cat scene, even if that's faked, there is still animal cruelty in the film. But what do you think of that? Well, I hate animal cruelty in films. I think it's so unnecessary. Why do you have to use that in a film to prove how evil somebody is? It's like, I think it's ridiculous, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I actually I hate those kind of scenes. And I also think it flies in the face. I mean, if, if it's true, I mean, well, I was, the rat scene is on fire. They actually are on fire. It kind of flies in the face of the, the point of compassion in the film. Like, you know, that, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't stand that. I, and not just in this movie, in any movie. I don't see any reason why. An animal has to be harmed to make a point in a movie. I mean, unless I guess it's if it's a, a documentary about a slaughterhouse or something. I don't know, but yeah, I remember you telling me that's actually a reason you're not the biggest fan of Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah, uh, that is true. Yes, that is true. I mean, I you know, in some ways, I admire the film, but in other ways, I just I, and again, I think it's like very unnecessary. It's a it's a way to it's like a cheap. It's a it's just a it's a it's a cheap way to show authenticity and it's like that's not what i'm really looking for in a film anyway and what do you think about the usage of human corpses as props in the film supposedly from what i heard it's because china had such a low special effects budget that he kind of did it at a necessity but again he could just be saying that to kind of cover his ass but what do you think uh yeah i mean i heard that as well and i've actually heard that about other movies too that have uh, what's his name jody mano by like his uh jody mano's uh beyond the dark I've heard that about other films too. I don't know. It's, it's kind of. I mean, I don't know how to feel about it. I mean, I, do you really need to show? I mean, and also to the dignity of the human body that was used, you know, in the scene. They obviously didn't have any choice about being in this movie or not. So I don't know. Again, I think it's unnecessary. Maybe I'm, I'm not as um, against it, I guess, as I am with animal cruelty. Again, I, when I watch movies, I'm not looking for sort of that sort of authenticity. I'm looking much more for like emotional authenticity intellectual authenticity so like you know if you had to fake that with like really fake looking human bodies like it wouldn't it wouldn't have ruined it for me what are some of the most disturbing scenes to you the film has a lot of infamous scenes like the pressure chamber Mm -hmm. scene where the guy's intestines blow out of his ass of course the scene with the frostbite experiment which is especially disturbing because prior to doing that to that woman we see this woman's child get killed right in front of her 
and she has a mental break where she thinks a pillowcase is her baby. So that makes the scene even more disturbing considering the mental trauma she already suffered prior to that. Uh, and then, there, of course, there's the scene where the Russian mother and her child are gassed to death. Uh, so there are a lot of really hard-to-watch scenes in this film, but are there any scenes that kind of got to you the most? Well, when they do the dissection of the little, of the Chinese boy uh, while he's still alive, right? When they do the vivisection, to me, that was just, like, shocking. That was just, like, they're so nice to him, the doctors. And you actually get to know that. Like, some of the other characters, uh, the, that um, the prisoners who are sort of put through these things, you really don't get to know them. Uh, but you get to know this this Chinese boy, you know, before he is, before he's, um, like, a live autopsy, right? They sort of, they, they cut him open, Right to see how his you know organs will actually sort of uh, respond to these kind of things, and that's it's, also the turning point for the Ishikawa character. Yeah, that was just like horrible to me. That was just a, that to me was the worst scene in the film. What is your opinion on whether this film is exploitation or if it's actually trying to say something? Well, like how how do you explore these atrocities without showing them? Would it be better if th these things were made more palatable for an audience? I mean, doesn't that make doesn't that do a tremendous injustice by watering this down to the to the victims and what happened? So to me, like, if, I mean, if you're going to explore the heart of darkness, you have to go all the way through. You can't just stop. You know what I mean? You have to sort of go all the way through and follow it all the way through and see where it goes. And I think this film does that. So, any closing thoughts on Men Behind the Sun, a.k.a. Black Sun 731? Well, I, I mean, it, it's I, it's hard to say if it's a good movie or not. I mean, it's it's a movie that you kind of experience, I suppose. But uh, I, I, I admire the director's, uh, you know, need to sort of tell this story. You know, it's not, it's not an easy story to tell. And I'm just surprised that there haven't been more, uh, you know, considering the amount of films that sort of talk about the uh, Holocaust, that there haven't been more films, uh, at least that I'm aware of, on this subject. I think this is a, a subject that definitely needs to be discussed more, shown more, to be sort of uh, made people aware more of this. But yeah, I mean, I think it's a powerful film. I mean, people might see it as an exploitation film or this, but I think it, 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 there's a there's a great power behind this, and I think it's um it's a film that's important to um to to see if you are interested in, in the history of World War II. Men Behind the Sun, I do think, is a powerful and even important film, and if you could look past the more exploitive elements of the film, if you could look past the violence, the gore, and depending on whether or not you watch the English dub, the questionable dubbing, this is actually a good film in its own right, but I can only recommend it for the right kind of audience. Keep in mind, this is a very, very disturbing film. So, only watch the movie if you know what you're getting yourself into. But again, it's a film that does tell a story that does kind of need to be told. Unit 731 was one of the darkest chapters in human history, and people shouldn't forget about what happened. Now, while Men Behind the Sun never had an official sequel, Godfrey Ho did two what were essentially rip-offs of Men Behind the Sun, Laboratory of the Devil in 1992, and Narrow Escape in 1994. Both films are sometimes referred to as Men Behind the Sun 2 and 3. And then TF Mo did his own follow-up to Men Behind the Sun in 1995, Black Sun The Nanking Massacre. I hope I'm saying that right, and yes, I know it's a real event that that movie also dramatizes. And that movie is sometimes referred to as Men Behind the Sun 4. I haven't seen any of the follow-ups, but have you? I have not actually. I've not seen any of the follow-ups. The only other movie I saw that um, that references this this event is the film Philosophy of a Knife, or Philosophy of the Knife. I remember, and that one it was weird. It was like a mixture of like there was like um, actual like archival footage and interviews with people that went through it, which was fascinating to see. But then there were like these really sort of like cheesy gothic industrial kind of looking um, uh, recreations of the experiments and like. There was, like, hardly any Asian people in it, so I'm like, I don't know what they were recreating. I think it was a Russian film, I believe. And, yeah, it just was, it was, it, it, it was a strange film, a very schizophrenic film. But, like I said, I mean, I, one of the things I did like about the film, and it was really long, too, it was, like, three hours, it was very long. But, anyway, 
that there was um, archival footage of a lot of this, of, of, of actual historical, you know, of um, the historical events, and also some interviews with people who actually went through it. So that, to me, that was interesting, much more interesting than the recreations that they tried to do of the experiments themselves. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. I've heard of it, but I've also heard it wasn't very good. But yeah, that was our review on Men Behind the Sun. Bye-bye, everyone.